I'd like to welcome my friend Joshua Hinson, uh, who's joining me from Ada, Oklahoma today. Uh, Josh is the director of the Chickasaw Nation Department of Language. He's also a linguist and an artist, a cultural historian, a learner and advocate of the Chickasaw language, and an all-around good human being. Uh, I wanted to talk with Josh. <laughs> I wanted to talk with Josh today to promote the wonderful things that the Chickasaw Language Revitalization Program does to share the gift of the Chickasaw language with the people um, and to demonstrate how access to broadband and technology supports the language program's mission. Uh, I also wish to share this conversation with the broader digital inclusion community who've long identified and encouraged more work with uh, targeting rural and tribal communities, which tend to have low levels of broadband access. Um, I think as a variety of players continue to work in these spaces, it's important to have discussions which address questions like what does meaningful use of information and communication technologies look like for sovereign tribal nations? And why is technology and internet access critical for stabilizing endangered languages? Uh, thank you, Josh, for sharing your time with me today, and we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, highly structured question and answer session. <laughs> um, Sounds good. So, uh, Josh, how did you first get involved uh, doing language revitalization work? Um, I, I started learning lang my own language um, right around 2000 when my first biological son was born. And um, I did a lot of stuff on my own for years. And then I started coming back to Oklahoma around 2003 and actually got to spend time with native speakers. So those first, I'd say four or five years was just a personal trying to figure out how to say things, spending time with native speakers. And then in, I don't know, 2004, when I hired on with the tribe, I was actually an archivist, photo archivist. And um, so I was doing that work, but I was also continuing to do language stuff. So by 2007, I had taught some community classes. And, uh, I took over as the as director of the, of the program. So personally, since 2000, I mean, I, I did a lot of stuff when I was a kid, um, just learning words and phrases and so forth. But seriously, since 2000, and professionally, so so. 2007. And 2007 is also when the language department was created, right? Okay, so we had, yeah, we, we had a, the program, the revitalization program kicked off with a, an a and grant and a master apprentice project in 2007. And then we formed the department in 2009. We've had some internal restructuring, so we don't use the, the verbiage department Okay. Anymore. It's reserved for higher levels, but officially we're the Chickasaw Language Revitalization Program. Program, okay. Un under a division and under a department. So Got you. Okay. Well, here to four referred to as the, the program. <laughs> okay. um, Josh, do you have, happen to have a microphone near your computer that you could speak into? Um, I, I think it might be. It might be using, I'm just, I'm gonna stand over here by this computer. It might be using the uh, internal mic. Right. It's a little, it's a little quiet on this end. So I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll type up a transcript anyway, but that's okay. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use the, uh, I'm gonna switch. See if this helps. Oh, that's great, that's great. Is that better? Way better. Okay. Okay. Good. So. Uh, the camera is here, the mic was here, now the mic's here, so Perfect. hopefully it'll yeah. sound better. We're in, we're in business. Okay. Um, Good, okay. Okay, well thanks for that, uh, that overview of the, the language program. Um, so I think most of the people who will view this video probably aren't familiar with the specific activities that are involved in language revitalization. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the varied things that you do um, with the language revitalization program. Okay, sure. So the the big 
the big picture is we have in Chickasaw Nation, we have 65,000 tribal citizens, give or, give or take. Um, approximately 50% of our tribal citizenship are 21 years of age and younger. So we're fairly young tribal population, which is interesting. That is. Um, but yeah. But of those 65,000, we have less than 50 uh, first language speakers. If you include passive bilinguals, people that were formerly um, fluent, and then you know users of the language, people that are learning in some form or fashion, that number probably goes up to, I don't know, 250, maybe 500 people with more than just a passing knowledge of the language. So you have this kind of tension between creating a, a new generation of conversational speakers which by necessity is very small, and uh, attention between uh, having high quality um, access to enrichment products for the majority. So what we are, we're always doing in the department is trying to kind of balance the needs of those two populations. I mean, it's a single tribal population, but the needs and the approaches are different. So on the immersion side, we started with Master Apprentice, which is a traditional one-on-one -on -one language learning approach. We've since gone to a modified group approach based on um, some Salish folks doing work in Canada and the Sac and Fox here in Oklahoma. So it would be um, a highly proficient second language learner, a couple of native speakers, and then that sort of cohort of learners for two to three years. So they do that every day, six to eight hours a day. And their goal is to become proficient in the language, conversationally proficient. Everything else is on the enrichment side. So what we're really wanting to do is provide high quality language enrichment, language education, however you want to call it, experiences for people of all ages, whether it be our kids language club, which is like eight to 14, all the way up to community classes for, for adults. Um, Rosetta Stone for people at large and for people at home. Whatever the case may be, we just want to have our citizens have good experiences learning their language so that they have positive feelings about the language. Um, the goal is not to, to have a highly proficient native level speaker out of a community class, but it's for them to spend time with native speakers, have positive experiences, and learn things that are useful for them. We have the same very pragmatic approach with our youth programs, um, with our educational programs we do for employees. We just want people to feel good about their language and about the language, you know, the, the people for whom they work, non-tribal employees and community members and so forth. Uh, we just want to teach anybody that wants to learn Chickasaw. So that's sort of a rambling way to say we, we do both. We do enrichment and we do immersion for different to different ends for slightly different purposes. Um, are, do you support any distance learning activities for your immersion students? So the, uh, the Chikasha Academy, which is the immersion program, it is a full-time employment. So you have to literally be in Ada, commute to Ada, move to Ada. And there's only two seats at any given time. So we don't really do, we don't have to, because they're right here. What we do for people at large is we have, um, using Google Hangouts mm -hmm. and some of our curricular materials, uh, the stuff written by Dr. Monroe with native speaker, uh, Catherine Wilmond. We do Google Hangouts where they're working through our grammar book, uh, our teaching grammar. And so they can be far flung, you know, as long as they have an internet connection, they have a live a live opportunity with actual people to work through the material and then to communicate. So whether it be introductions or social niceties or basic day-to-day -day language, it's not just I'm working through a book, but I have a group of other tribal members that I can, that I'm actually communicating with. And that's taught by Sherry Begay, who's a second language learner actually living in Arizona. Oh. So we trained, we trained her, she to you know to do the instruction and she works with them we've also talked about something to that effect for rosetta stone we're not really quite sure how that would work but we're looking into it rosetta stone is obviously the main sort of distance um 
program. I don't know if you'd call it distance, but it's, you know, it's kind of autodidact, self-study, work through the material. It listens to you and tells you how your pronunciation is, stuff like that. Um, it's a high quality product, but it's a different sort of experience to use it in isolation than it is with the people that use it in Google Hangouts. True, yeah, absolutely. That, that's great. I didn't know about the Google Hangouts group. Uh, that's um, yeah. really a clear, a clear demonstration of how um, you know, video conferencing um, enabled through broadband access uh, directly to yes. language revitalization. So I'm, I'm happy to hear yeah. about that one. Um, yeah. You also have the Chickasaw Basic app, which is available mm -hmm. for Android and for iOS. Um, was that yeah, the, it runs yes. it runs natively, so you can download it to your iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, but we designed the website to operate as an app if you're on Android. Okay. Um, people have asked us for the Android app, but honestly, we'll probably move away and just have it run. The user experience is as if it was an app, mm -hmm. but if you can provide the same content in a browser and not have to go through all the iTunes shenanigans and you know also the, the Android store, whatever they call it. I mean, why not do that sort of stuff? Right. So we did that in 2009. That was 2009, okay. Yeah, so we've, we've gotten a lot of, um, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of that, honestly. Mm -hmm. So, so more of a responsive web page for mobile for mobile use versus uh, designated apps. So. Yeah, I mean, people. Uh, it's also much easier to do um, edits on the fly when it's a web environment. You don't have to go to any outside um, providers, you know, who have designed, for example, an app for us or something. We just go to our web guys and say, "Hey, there's a typo. Can you fix this? There's some new audio." it's really responsive and we can, uh, we'll be able to update it, you know. We haven't updated it since 2009. We've been doing other stuff, but we could, we could if we wanted to. Great. Um, so maybe, maybe down the line, some more plans to, to um, expand the different um, language categories that are up there and maybe add new recordings. And, um, yeah, I mean, uh, we think that there, it's probably time to update the, the app um, to have a little more, to not have like siloed products, but some communication between, for example, what we're doing on the federal grant side with Rosetta Stone and between Rosetta Stone and the app. Um, there's no reason that these things can't sort of reflect one another. Mm -hmm. um, we're also doing things like making, trying to make our dictionaries available online mm -hmm. where they're indexed and you know fully searchable either way. English to Chickasaw and Chickasaw to English. And then ideally we'll be having um, uh, audio files, mm -hmm. um, you know, linked audio files for each of the entries. We'll be doing that this year with the Mrs. Hume's dictionary, our original dictionary. And then who knows, maybe in the future we'll be able to do it with the analytical dictionary. So we won't stop selling physical products. People really like to have the book in their hand. Um, but if we can provide access in particular to this audio, which isn't really uh, readily available to citizens at large and other people, it just seemed like a no brainer. Yeah. So without, um, you know, widespread distribution of physical, uh, physical dictionary outputs, um, or whatever it may be, it, it does seem like being able to, to provide access online is the key to making sure that everyone in the nation can can get to it at some point. Right. Uh, I mean, we don't, we want to remove barriers, right? So, I mean, obviously just like we have physical copies in libraries, we want to have electronic copies online. So even if a citizen doesn't have um, a copy of the dictionary, when they're at the medical center, they could go to a kiosk and access the internet. They don't have internet at their house even, right? But they'd be able to access both Rosetta Stone um, and our other products whenever they're at a nation facility because we've specifically put um, language kiosks in all these locations. Oh, great. Um, and those locations, I'm, I'm presuming, also offer free wireless internet. Um, yes. Any, any nation facility has Chickasaw Country Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. and then um, 
all of the the kiosks themselves that are principally for Rosetta Stone, they have wired they have wired connections, so they're fast. They're they're quite a bit faster than the Wi-Fi, but the Wi-Fi works whatever building you're in. Mm -hmm. um. I know this is a little bit outside the scope of your work, but since we're talking about internet access, um, mm -hmm. what, what's your uh, perception of how many Chickasaw citizens have internet access or can afford internet access at home? Um. <laughs> Man, I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't. I couldn't even venture a guess. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you think about. I don't know. You think about like an internet wasteland like in, on Navajo Nation, right? Like there are whole areas where it, it's even difficult to get cell signal. Maybe it's getting better. Um, but here at home, I mean, our most rural areas, you'd be hard pressed not to find a, a cell signal somewhere. Um, broadband, um, DSL, fiber, all that stuff is certainly not as readily available, you know, out. Um, in the country, but our rural parts compared to other reservation based tribes, it's just a totally different experience. So I know, for example, um, tribal members that do live fairly rural, you know, 40 or 50 miles from a town, but they can still get their internet through uh, like a cell tower kind of provider, you know what I mean? And even us, you know, we live like eight or nine miles out of town and we, we had to do something similar with AT&T because there's no decent internet out there. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason why, you know, we've, we're making available in Rosetta Stone in particular, physical products, CDs and DVDs with the content for people that want to have, at least in part, that user experience, but they're not able to readily access, mm -hmm. um, you know, through a computer. Um, we also have mobile apps though, um, in the Rosetta Stone product. So you can download, like when you're in town, you can download each module and it, the functionality is exactly the same. So I can download it at Medical Center, go drive 60 miles to the house and still use Rosetta Stone, even though I don't have good, reliable internet. But it is a problem. I mean, uh, any, any, any tribe you know, needs access to the internet to do what we have to do these days. Yeah, and to, to take full advantage of the um, right. all, all the great uh, online services mm -hmm. that you offer. Right. Um, I think. So I, mean, I, don't, I don't have statistics, but I mean, it, I'm sure access is an issue um, unless you're a uniquely situated tribal nation, you know, next to Google headquarters or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, we. Uh, one of the the things that the digital inclusion community also identifies is affordability. So. Even if right. you know, maybe there are cell towers there, and theoretically somebody could, um, you know, have access through their cell phone or through a mobile hotspot, if they can't afford those monthly payments, which in rural areas are uh, super expensive, right? Um, then that's another barrier to to that adoption. So it all it all it all. Plays yeah, when we, when we were rural, like twenty say in 2013, our five gigs of data cost us like $70 a month, give or take. And now we're on like the last grandfathered DSL spot in this particular neighborhood. And it's, I don't even know what it is, a hundred gigs for $70. It's quite different. Um, I don't have to police my children's use as much as I used to, but um, yeah, $70 is a lot of money. Yeah, it can be prohibitive for, for some mm -hmm. families and for some households. Right. Um, I want to go back to talking about Rosetta Stone because that is, um, I, I remember hearing about this example from uh, Dr. Julia Morgan, who's worked with you on the uh, Rosetta Stone program, um, where she had mentioned to me that, um, you know, I, everyone's very excited about Chickasaw Rosetta Stone, um, and we're, we're very proud to have it out there as a product, um, but Governor uh, Anoa Tubby, um, mm -hmm recognized that home internet access is a barrier for citizens who might otherwise want to use Rosetta Stone. And actually, right. um, I, I believe he had to request officially from Rosetta Stone that they continue to produce CD versions of Rosetta Stone because, because not everyone had internet access. Am I representing that correctly? 
It's, it, yeah, it's, it wasn't quite like that, but um, basically the, the issue is that even Rosetta Stone as a company has moved entirely to a cloud-based computing mo you know, sort of model. So if you see, if you know, you're in the airport, or you're in the mall or whatever, and you see one of their little yellow boxes, if it happens to have disks in it, it's an old um, product. Like they're, lit they're not even producing physical products anymore. So given that the platform that we authored Rosetta Stone on was completely cloud-based, to get the full user experience, you either have to have a, a computer with an internet connection, you have to have a mobile device with at least Wi-Fi, if not, you know, like data over the air, in order to have the full, all the lessons, the interactivity, everything. What we did do was provide DVDs of the videos with English and Chickasaw subtitles and then all the audio content in physical form. They're actually being printed right now um, for one, you know, one per household amongst the tribal citizens that are using Rosetta Stone. But um, because it's a, it's a digital cloud-based um, technological solution to a fundamentally sort of human problem, an analog problem of language loss, people are unfortunately left out. Mm -hmm. And that's just the nature of the beast. You can't meet 100% of the need with a technological solution. Um, our goal has always to been to have, you know, at least 10% of our tribal population as active users. Um, so 6,500 people actively using Rosetta Stone. Um, but we understand that, that it will leave people out because I can't just give you a CD-ROM. I mean, who uses a CD-ROM anymore anyway, right? You don't I can't to, give... That drives on most computers, so... Right, right. So, I mean, in the case of Rosetta Stone Chickasaw, I can't even give you a USB flash drive that you can run the program from because it's not a program. You know, it's this cloud-based thing. So what we've tried to do is make every effort to maximize access for, for everybody, which is why we hit hard the, the app version, which has been very successful. The functionality that allows it to work offline has been very successful. And of course, the, the physical products. It wasn't really quite what we wanted. We would have preferred a physical product, but that's just not the way the world is going. I mean, in general, you know? I'm just going to share my screen really quickly and bring up the um, bring up the system requirements that are listed on Rosetta Stone because I think it um, underlines what you have just identified here. So here's our system requirements for the client and administrator apps, and they do you know they do say of course you know you need a device with an appropriate operating system, but they have really specific examples of the, um, the bandwidth required. Um, here they say uh, yes. at least 500 kilobytes per second, which is actually a, a pretty low, uh, pretty slow speed um, considering, but, mm -hmm. you know, but is, is manageable for um, a lot of, a lot of folks. Um, they also, uh, specifically mention latency rates, which I think is interesting, um, which is about that delay um, in, in the feedback. Um, I thought I saw one earlier where it said, high-speed internet is required. There, you know, you can't use it without this. So I, I thought, um, you know, they're obviously identifying it, but having right. a backup method for people who don't have access isn't currently present. They do have, um, I, can't, I can't speak to the functionality, but they do have the Advanced Languages app, and then they also have the general Rosetta Stone app. Um, but I couldn't tell you, for example, if you were using Spanish or French or something, I just don't know uh, if you can download, like, you know, lesson one, mm -hmm. use it, and then it up, you know, updates your progress once you have that connection again. But it does work that way for, for Chickasaw. Um, I can work through the content, and then whenever I'm back on that Wi-Fi hotspot, it updates the Rosetta Stone servers, and it helps me track my progress. Um, the, the average, I would say the average citizen does have some kind of smart 
device, whether it be a phone or a tablet. That's not unusual these days, even if they don't have it connected to a network, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we, that, that, that's pretty consistent with national data too, that households are most likely to have a, a smartphone um, and right. probably not a computer or a um, laptop, which is, um, you know, kind of a, a device that supports additional use, um, right? Because right. to do everything on a cell phone is pretty difficult, but um, yeah. that's still the way that things are going. Um, right. I'm wondering if you've kind of seen anything just in your data they work with speakers um, or if you've even heard feedback from people who are using the app in Rosetta Stone about uh, digital skills and some of the basic computer skills of um, of users when they're they're trying to access this. Well, I mean, there there's always um, there's always complications with people that want the product, for example but they might not, they're not particularly like, you know, tech savvy mm -hmm. or they're tech savvy, but they were trying to, you know, run it on their iPhone when it doesn't work in the mobile browser. It has to be the app mm -hmm. version, right? Or issues with, um, I, don't, I don't know how to access the application. Mm -hmm. You know, like we get people who will physically print off the application and mail it in, which we're fine. We want to let people access it however they want. When it's really just much easier, you know, to just fill it out online and send it in. So I, I would think with, with any kind of technological solution, there's a learning curve for particular parts of the population. And I don't know that it's necessarily like one demographic over the other. I could probably tell you if we looked into the data, but I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, but uh, that's why we have our full-time, you know, guy, Mark Francis, one of my employees, and that's all he does is Rosetta Stone, helping troubleshoot. There's an actual person you can get to. Um, he helps people, you know, access the product ultimately whenever they're having issues of, of any sort. And that's been, that's been really nice to have somebody full-time on staff. Absolutely. So, yeah. With 6,500 users as a target, I mean, he stays busy. I bet, yeah. That's, that's great yeah. that you have a dedicated tech support person right. to help with that yeah. adoption. That's, um, you know, kind of one of the critical components that um, we identify as part of digital inclusion is having somebody on the ground, someone local, someone trusted who can, right. well, when that device ine inevitably breaks down or when, right. when somebody raises the question. So I'm, I'm, uh, I think you guys are, are doing the right thing in, in that regard. And it's almost totally on the on the front end. I mean, you know, because currently it's it's not a commercial product, right? And it's limited to citizens and their immediate family members. There's an extra level um, of kind of you know verification required that's just not an issue with Rosetta Stone product out in the in the regular world, right? Like I pay my money, I have Spanish. Well you have to fill out our application. We have to identify you in the tribal enrollment system, make sure you're really a Chickasaw tribal member. You know, we give accounts, individual accounts to everyone in your household that you've identified. So that takes some time. Mm -hmm. um, but once we're, we're getting through that process, any additional issues on the front end, we're finding that the user experience is quite easy, um, you know, in terms of navigating the product. And we're, we also have, Rosetta Stone's very responsive. If a user, for example, finds something that they think is incorrect, they bounce it back to us. We can make changes if necessary or say, no, that's, that's what we intended. Um, so it's, it's responsive on both ends, on the front end and then the back end and in the middle too, so. Yeah. It's, some, it's some great user design that went into it. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we want to make it as best, you know, the, the best user experience as possible. It's already intimidating to learn a language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a little less intimidating because it's kind of a solo, like, a, you know, just you and your computer. But um, if you don't have the skills to, the required sort of technological skills to even get on the program, it can make it even more negative. And we don't want that. We want people to have good experiences with their language, regardless of the the medium through which they're accessing the language. That's, that's an excellent point. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, I want to switch gears a little bit um, mm -hmm. to talk about the, um, I guess the the, the elder lang the Chickasaw language meetings. Yes. Uh huh. With the elders every month because those are uh, very exciting and kind of unique for different language programs throughout the country that you can have um, groups of speakers who are determining. Uh, how, how to incorporate new terms into the Chickasaw language in, in ways right. that make sense for construction of Chickasaw language rather mm -hmm. than a, uh, you know, some sort of botched translation from English um, into Chickasaw. So I was right. wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the language committee meetings um, mm -hmm. and especially talking about some of the technology words that get uh, discussed. Okay. So uh, Governor um, Anoatabi created this language committee in the mid 90s and it's lifetime appointments of native speakers um, for the most part. And right now it's roughly 25 native speakers. We have a couple of members who are children of native speakers who are more passive bilinguals. And we have one member who was uh, fluent as a child and came through our immersion program and she joined as a committee member. So they meet once a month. They're about three hour meetings and principally we're doing interpretation work. Whether it be long, you know, passages of scripture or uh, like a, a song, like we translated Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer for a Christmas performance that they're doing. Um, but this work with, uh, with neologism development really started in about 2008. Um, we created this document called the need for new words at a committee meeting and we distributed it and asked them to consider, um, kind of the state of the language where, you know, the, the existing technology in some cases was a hundred years old, you know, our, our newest new words were coined at the turn of the century or sometimes earlier. The word for car, the word for phone, train, these kind of things um, were, were quite old. And so there's this huge lexical gap because, you know, people of their generation, our youngest speakers are kind of boomers. They were born in the forties. Um, with some exceptions, they're just, they're not engaging with technology in the same way that younger folks are. So we didn't know how to say cell phone and internet and things like this, uh, computer, for example. So the language committee, there are elders, and of course we defer to them, like almost all the work we do kind of grows out of that work that we do with them on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So like we go to them once a month, we talk about what we're wanting to do. And, you know, they just kind of help guide us as our elders, which is, a, you know, it's just the right way to, to do things. So we said, um, we have a couple of options. We can say things in English, but just say it in a Chickasaw way. Like you can say ka instead of car. We don't have ours, right? Um, we can borrow from related languages. Um, we could borrow from Choctaw or Creek or, or whatever the case may be. Or we can interpret these kind of foreign English terms in a Chickasaw way. And what I tried to do in creating this document was show them strategies that our ancestors had used to, to sort of accommodate new technologies in the past. So for example, the word for rock, Tully, was moved um, over and by lexical extension now means metal. Um, the word asunnak means a metal can, but now it can also mean the, the milk cans that women fill with rocks and use for dancing. In the same way that loksi, which means turtle, can also mean the, uh, the turtle shells filled with stones that they use for dancing. We show them a word like horse, which was isi, a hoba. It means it resembles a deer. And over time, it became shortened. So it, now it's isoba or soba. But you, when, that you could sort of see the light come on when they, they thought, well, yeah, of course our ancestors were creating, were creating 
new words to accommodate for foreign technologies and so forth. Well, we can do it too. So we gave that to them. They decided, well, let's go ahead and try to create these neologisms and see what we can come up with. So one of the first ones was computer and their word for computer was um, tali lopi, which just means a metal brain. Metal brain. I'm gonna bring up- Yeah, metal brain. On the app, on the app here, can you see my screen? Yes, uh-huh, there you go, yeah. So here's the app, so. Um, yeah. Can you, can you repeat that again? Um, a, metal, uh, a metal brain? Yeah, the tali lopi uh, under computer. Mm -hmm. And then the other, the secondary entry here is tali ayatana, which means um, kind of like the metal thing at which you learn, hmm. a metal place for learning. Um, the word for email, holiso paski, mm -hmm. means a fast letter, a fast paper. Um, Lisa, is that, that for research or, or something about learning as well? No, well, it, it is for the Holisso Research Center, but the word Holisso is an archaic word that used to mean finely spotted, kind of like um, someone that has freckles or a guinea hen's feathers, you know, those crazy guineas with the really finely spotted feathers. So I assume when our ancestors encountered writing, they just said Holisso, oh, it's spotted. And then it came to mean paper, then it came to mean book. Mm -hmm. um, letter and so forth. So what I suggested was shmali holiso, which means lightning paper, because it's an electronic, you know, kind of thing. But they thought that was dumb. So yeah. I didn't, I didn't win that one. The word for electricity is shmali um, okchi, which means lightning juice kind of cool. That's not a new word. That's, that's in Mrs. Hume's dictionary. So she wrote that in 73. I, I couldn't tell you when that was coined, but at any rate. Um, in other cases, it, it wasn't so much a reinterpretation of, um, of, well, no, it is a reinterpretation. What am I trying to say? In other cases, it was just lexical extension, like nanola for iPod. Mm -hmm. It just means something that makes the noise by itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, so like a radio is also called nanala. So we just move that word over in the same way they took the word for possum and used it to describe pigs, you know, four or 500 years ago. Um, phone is the hard thing, the hard talking thing. And that's, a, that's an older, it's a new word, but it's an older new word. What about uh, internet? How did, how did that come about? Um, well, so we talked about just using the word for web, uh, which is like, it's kind of like the spider holds on, the thing the spider holds on to. But they didn't really like that because it was just, it was too literal with the spider. So the, I, we just basically said the internet's basically nothing but a bunch of computers talking to one another. You know, all this content that, that we're experiencing is just worldwide, this huge network of connected computers. So they said, well, let's just call it a bunch of metal brains. So that's what, that's what they did. Yeah. Tali Lopi Lawa, a bunch of metal brains. It works for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, an accurate description as well. Yeah. How about uh, telecom? Tele television would... A uh, teleconference, yeah, Holba to Fama Anumpoli. It's kind of like um, a picture meeting that, that, that you can also speak at. Holba to Fama is like a, a place of meeting. And then you have the image part, which is Holba, and the Anumpoli part, which is to speak. So, a uh, video game is cool. Holba is chukoshkomo. It means uh, the thing with which you play with pictures, give or take. Playing with images was, a, was a, our approximation for a video game. Holba is chukoshkomo. Yeah. Um, how, how are these terms adopted, especially these tech terms? Do they seem to be um, like when new learners encounter these? Uh, these new lexemes, do they 
run away with it or do they still kind of say, oh, you know, they, they insert iPod in there or, you know, Google without. Oh, sure. Well, in, in our experience, you know, the, the, the neologisms that are most salient, you know, to our kind of daily life are the ones that stick. Mm -hmm. So honestly, of all of our neologism work, the ones that have stuck the most um, are probably our textisms where we created, you know, like, see you later mm -hmm. is like C CPL, which is Chapislacho. And thank you, Yakuki, is YKK. So we use those amongst ourselves all the time. Um, cell phone stuck, internet stuck, um, email stuck. Te text is one. Uh, te texting is um, ilbak ishki ishtanumpuli. That mean that's the verb that means to text. It means speaking with the mother of the hand. So like talking with your thumbs, <laughs> um, which is kind of cool. So um, what's, ilbak, the what's the nominalized version of text? Um, it's um, ilbak ishki anumpuli. So it's like the 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 speech of the mother of the hand, something like that. It started as ilbakishki anumpoli, which is the nominalized. That's how they created the first one that just meant text, the actual text. And then we added this instrumental isht, removed the glottal stop, and then that makes it, you know, the verbal form. So I could say um, ilbakishki that means like I'm texting you like I'm texting you with my thumbs or I'm communicating to you with my thumbs anyway something like that but that one was that one was created by a second language learner um, who was a co-teacher of mine uh, Mary Monroe who taught at Bing high school at the time and that was one that it's kind of cool where we brought it to them and they said oh hey that's pretty cool um, and we do have some speakers that text. The late Jerry Imitachi and I used to text one another in Chickasaw all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I have four years of our exchanges that I just screenshot, you know, right. the day the day after he passed away. I was like, oh, I've got to screenshot these. I can't lose them. So I have like four years of texts between you and I, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that's a um, tremendous record. In other cases, you know, like we made up a word for capybara you know, the biggest rodent in the world from South America? It's Oak Pachasle Minko, which means the swamp king or swamp leader, which is a Chickasaw interpretation of the indigenous word for the capybara. And I can't remember what indigenous language group it's from, but at any rate, that is not high frequency. You know, like if you ask a speaker or a learner, they're not gonna remember the word for capybara. But sometimes it's just, it's a fun intellectual sort of challenge to mm -hmm. see, you know, we can, um, we can uh, account for anything we want to in our language using the tools, you know, the, the, the new words creation tools that our ancestors used. We don't have to just say stuff in English. Code, code switching and being fully bilingual is, a, is an acceptable part of the Chickasaw language community. I mean, all of our speakers are fully bilingual. And so we do a lot of code switching back and forth and back and forth. But sometimes it just feels good to be able to say it in Chickasaw and not have to, you know, throw it in English. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We do have some calcs, like we say, is Skypey for Skype mm -hmm. or um, Googly for Google. So I can say chingooglily, like I'm Googling you, stuff like that. Um, we borrowed uh, the, there's the indigenous word. Uh, I can't remember the language group, but it means kangaroo. Oh, Okay, and so I'm going to be collecting that word solution. I'm going to go do something. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. I uh, um, thought this was a pretty empty room. <laughs> good times. Um, anyway, the last the last neologism is uh, kankalo, which is our way of saying kangaroo. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to describe it, so we just borrowed the indigenous word. 
and said, because we don't have R's and we put a glottal stop at the end. So kankalo means kangaroo at any rate. I really love New Word's work. It's a lot of fun. Right, yeah. I remember yeah, the, the committee meeting that I attended, they, uh, they came up with the term for honey badger, which I thought was uh, kind oh, of in yeah. relation to back in the day when everyone online was obsessed with the honey badger. And I think someone right. said, we need a Chickasaw word for it. Yeah, yeah. And I think it was something like, oh, it was like a mean yeah. raccoon yeah. or the mean, the mean, the word for badger is oktak shawi, which means a prairie raccoon. I think it was oktak shawi sikopa, which means like a mean badger, but I can't remember. Anyway, not high frequency, but it was fun. It was fun to create. Yeah. Great. That's, uh, I, I really love hearing about the Neoja zones that you guys work on, and um, I'd be interested to know some of that side talk conversations, especially with the elders, when they're you know, hear, maybe hearing about these tech terms for the first time, and then having to uh, develop a Chickasaw term for it. So I think that's um, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, there's a whole lot of side talk, both in Chickasaw and in English, about how um, you know, like, well, what the heck is that? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. You know, what's a, what's a, what's a thumb drive? What's a megabyte? Uh -huh. I don't know. Yeah. Stuff like that. What's, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What's a surface? What's a Microsoft surface book and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. They don't. Yeah. They don't. They, a lot of them have smartphones um, and they do know how to surf the internet, but um, yeah, they're not uh, an 83 year old language committee member is not, you know, gonna burn up the internet with with her techie skills she just wants to see photos of her grandkids on Facebook and that's cool no problem that's the relevant content that that's right. important that's to right. adoption so we're for it that's right um, well I want to be pretty mindful of your time but I, I was wondering if you have um, any final thoughts to say about um, you know, about how technology is used, um, you know, broadly in, in language revitalization. So we didn't really touch on some of the other um, aspects of language revitalization work, which can include uh, documentation and obviously use of yeah. uh, tech is really uh, inherent in, in those processes. Um, yeah. as, as well as, you know, we know that the distribution and access side is, is important as well um, and the learning. Um, any yeah, I mean, if, new recording work. If some, yeah, if, I mean, if somebody, uh, a community came to me, a community with uh, living speakers and said, what should we do? What should we do as we're developing a language program? There's a lot of variables. Um, so it would depend on kind of their unique situation. But one thing that, that I would always, you know, just strongly um, recommend is, spend lots of time with your native speakers, spend lots of time in your language, even if you don't know what's going on, record everything, video, audio, make sure it's backed up, and then use the power of technology and what at least right now is a relatively open internet. We won't talk about that other stuff, but relatively- That's another talk. <laughs> right, and in particular, use the power of, um, platforms like YouTube, um, you know, social media like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, use those things. So you can, not only are you documenting this last generation of native speakers, and, and uh, you can also use the power of these things to distribute what you're learning to others. Because inevitably, even if you're a small community, there's gonna be people who are far flung, who want to hear things of their native language. Um, maybe you don't have 65,000 people, but you have someone who's, stationed overseas, you know, and he or she wants to hear their language. Well, they could do that, you know, if you're sharing audio and video and these other things through the power of the internet. So um, we have really good documentation. We have excellent documentation through the work of Dr. Pam Monroe and Catherine Wilman. Um, but they were really kind of old school at the time. So, you know, Dr. Moon has tons and tons and tons of workbooks, uh, notebooks rather filled with her transcriptions but I don't have any audio of a monolingual speaker. Mm. 
I have no audio of a monolingual speaker. So we're recording the heck out of these, this last generation of 50 speakers. Because no matter what happens, as long as you're smart about like migrating, you know, as um, formats change and so forth, if you do your best to migrate these audio files, they will, in, they'll be in existence forever. Just like Edison's wax cylinders are still around. Now they're being digitized because you can't play them without ruining them almost. But um, you just want to do whatever we can to give life to the language in all these different ways. So a hundred years from now, someone could access our audio recordings and continue this work we're doing and make that work better. Um, so spend lots of time and document the heck out of everything. Use the power of the internet. Um, there's a way to get it done that sort of transcends um, money so often. I mean, I can, I, can use, I can use my iPhone to create high quality recordings of native speakers. Mm -hmm. I don't have to have like a three thousand dollar Marantz and a you know, whiz bang ninja wizard microphone set up. This this is pretty good. So I don't know. That's probably just what I would say. Just get record started, everything. Right? You won't you won't be alive forever. Stop messing around and just record stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Th those were some excellent points, and and I'm glad you brought up uh, the the you know porting forward those recordings as well. The the data management yeah. side and yeah. Starting yeah whatever tech you have available um, yeah um we do have we have a relationship both uh my personal papers dr morgan and then a lot of things from the department are archived at sam noble mm -hmm. at their native language archive so there's nothing wrong with redundancy i mean i have like six backups of my backup because i have you know 10 years of language work on these computers um, even if this building burns down i have all that stuff at sam noble right? I have all this stuff on a drive at home. Don't, don't let your granny's audio tape recordings from 73 burn up in your house, make copies of them. Yep. Um, that's sort of an archival thing, but yeah, hey, that's, that's my thing. So I'm glad you're bringing yeah. all those good points about uh, archives and uh, data management. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but it, it's it's critical to do whatever we can to make sure that the work we're doing is documented and continues into the future. Um, and in particular, audio and video is a critical part of that. You know, Absolutely. writing is fine, but many communities have no writing systems at all. So, I mean, what are you going to do? Yeah. Absolutely right. Uh, anyway. Well, Josh, thank you so much for you know taking time out of your day to talk with me, and I. I'm sure. so grateful for your expertise on the subject. I know you've been doing this great work for a long time now, and I, I really appreciate your, your insight and your frankness. Uh, yeah, well, I appreciate the opportunity. I hope this is useful for somebody. Um, and uh, we'll, let's talk again. I'm sure we could talk about many, many more things. Yeah. Yes, please. All right. Okay. <laughs> Take care, Josh. All right, thanks. See ya. Bye.